Today is the beginning of the final week of my 65th year. On next Sunday, I will have my birthday at 2.25. I'm sorry, 2.22 in the afternoon. On next Sunday, I will be 65. And I'm, I'm thinking about all this stuff I got to do. I was telling Tim, I need to make a dentist appointment this week and see if they can get me in this week because I don't know if my mass health ends and then I got to go on to uh, getting something else, you know. I, I don't know anything about this stuff and I got all this packs of stuff in the mail reminding me I'm getting ready to turn 65 and need to check out Medicare and then some supplemental things and I'm, I'm, I'm getting confused. Like, oh, I thought Medicare was better than mass health, but it might not cover my pills I got to take and my eye drops for my eyes and all this stuff, but it's so exciting to me. I've always, always, always loved completing a year. I've, I've never been one of those people who didn't like looking forward to my birthday coming. I'm, I'm blown away that I'm still alive. Uh, it was not anyone's bet that I would make it to 21. And so the fact that I'm about to be 65 is quite, quite, quite remarkable to me and many people who knew me in my earlier days uh, as the guy who always was burning his candle at both ends and didn't really, wasn't a safe guy. I, I used to be called Mr. Spaced Out Guy. I would be driving down the street and all I, could, all I would need to see was a squirrel beside the road and it would catch the fullness of my attention until my car was suddenly going into somebody's mailbox or up against a fence or a tree. So I've had a lot of grounding that I've needed to do in here. I think that I told you all that my sister, uh, Crystal, who uh, had the, I'm so grateful that she had the opportunity to come and visit Unity in the City and to attend the concert and to participate in that concert. That was a fabulous concert. We really need to do something like that again, Sister Dr. Carroll at some point, but my sister Crystal uh, was the one that I took care of. I really felt like her life depended upon me. I think I told you that when she was born, she was born, she was the fourth child. She was the baby of our family, and she was three years younger than me. But when she was born, she was born with a very intense uh, asthma. It was so intense that she would go into convulsions, and her eyes would roll into the back of her head, and from the time she was born, she was in an incubator so much of the time, she'd come home for a few days. Next thing I know, everybody's getting woke, awakened in the middle of the night to rush her to the hospital, mm -hmm. trying to save her. And I remember one time uh, that uh, they, they would often not know if she would make it through the night. And I felt like it was my job at three years old to keep her alive. I remember one time we were in the hospital and I remember my mother leaning over the incubator and saying, keep fighting for your life, Chrissy, keep fighting for your life. Keep fighting to stay here. Give her all you got. Mm -hmm. And I remember the doctor saying to my mom, I don't know how to break this to you except to just tell you directly, your daughter is not fighting to stay here. She's fighting to go back. We are fighting for her to stay here. She does not want to be here. It's as though her soul decided, I made a mistake, I got in the wrong line. I did not want to sign up for this trip to go to planet Earth, take on physical reality, live in a field of polarity. I didn't sign up for it. So once I heard that and got that my sister wasn't even fighting for her life, I had to up the ante on my fight for her life. Mm -hmm. I spent so many hours. I would get up in the middle of the night three or four times to go to wherever she was when she was in the house and just to tell her, I'm going to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. One thing that Crystal and I shared was that in our experience of living was that both of us were molested when we were children uh, by a number of people. Mine started when I was seven years old. Her started when she was two and a half years old in a preschool. So I can remember having a number of my years where I was looking at my own progress of overcoming the pain and overcoming the, the, the imprisonment that that experience put me in. And I would say, come on, Chrissy, you can do it. 
I, I'm doing it. You can do it. And I would at times wonder why she wasn't giving more to this fight of overcoming, overcoming this bondage of the experience that she had. Because after all, I had the experience with more people than you. And if I can do it, then you can. It wasn't until I was a teenager that I entered into a field where I heard someone say, the difference between a child who gets molested at seven years old and a child who gets molested at two and a half years old is a big, fat difference. Mm -hmm. And you don't have any right, Carly, to be thinking Chrissy is going to get up and dust herself off as quickly as you do. I began to think about the complications of life and how each of us have an individual experience of life. I know that mom and dad had four children. We were all raised pretty much with the same rules, the same regulations, the same chores, the same church programming, the same everything. And I noticed that we were all very, very different. We had all made different decisions about what our experience was. When my siblings were sitting in church with me, and the minister, or the bishop, or the elder, or the three people that happened to be on the platform were praising God and thanking Jesus and telling the whole congregation, Jesus can do anything but fail, call on Jesus, his line is never busy, call him up and tell him what you want. And I could see that my siblings were all really excited to hear it, and I was having an entirely different experience because two of the people saying call on Jesus were praying on me. Mm -hmm. Mom, Dad, Rhonda, Crystal, Chuck, they had no clue. They had no clue. So they would look at me and say, oh, is your stomach upset? Didn't you get enough sleep? And I was processing, who is God that the people of God would be doing what they're doing to me. Mm -hmm. Driving home, everybody would be talking about how great Jesus was. And for the first year of my molestation, or for the first several months, I wasn't aware. But somewhere in the process, I began to dissociate and leave my body. And I would be able to see my body. I could see the adult who was doing what they were doing with me. But I would go to a garden and there was this awesome man there who told me that our job is to not let anything stop us. Our job is not to let anything crush us. Our job, in fact, is to keep getting up, dusting ourselves off, and keeping on, keeping on. It was also, I was told, my job to not confuse who God is with who some of the people of God are. I remember once seeing a bumper sticker when I was in my 20s that I loved, and it said, God, I love you with all my heart, but please spare me from your people. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, that's what I had to learn. That not everybody in the church is filled with the Christ spirit, mm -hmm. and that there are confused people everywhere you go. There are people everywhere you go all types of people. And so you must have a strong foundation within yourself. And so being a kid, I think, who struggled to make sense of the world, I always thank God for my disso dissociating because I was able to actually experience the experience that I'm not my body. My body was still there. I could see it. It was going through what it was going through. But Jesus would say to me, do you right now here in the garden do you experience and feel any of what's going on with them? And I would say, none at all. He said, your job is going to be to, even when you're not dissociated, when you're in that body, to learn how to know that you are beyond your circumstances. Last week when I was in Manhattan, I talked about how life is like two bubbles, and one bubble is inside of another bubble, and I think that I've presented that here at some point. But we're living in the bubble of our experience, our human experience. 
Many people in spiritual arenas do not honor the human experience of hell. It's as though you should get rid of your humanity and just remember your spirit and just remember your light and just remember your God. But the human experience is on purpose. That is why we are here. So I can have a human experience of having my heart broken. I can have a human experience of feeling disappointed by having been let down. I can have a human experience of getting freaked out by what looks like it is happening or may happen to the country, to the world, by what's going on in the Middle East, or what's going on in Washington, what's going on in my neighborhood, what's going on in Chicago, what's going on in Dallas, what's going on in Florida. We are either going to be like a reed shaking in the wind, or we're going to be like a tree planted by the waters that cannot be moved. And it's only through our God connection that we can be like that tree. When we are disconnected from the source of our power, the conscious knowing of the source of our power, then we are like a reed. So this human bubble, this bubble of our humanity is to be honored and it's to be appreciated, but we are not to forget that that bubble is inside of a larger bubble. And that larger bubble is our spiritual being. It is our essential self. When this, when this, when you hear words like my essence is of God, I am inherently good. That's the big bubble that we really are. That's the eternal being. That being was never born and will never die. It is surrounding the smaller bubble of our humanity. It's to honor both. So what Jesus was telling me is that if you, you are living and experiencing life in a small bubble, but seek to always remember that it's inside of a bigger bubble. And this is a balancing act for us to do, to honor the humanity while knowing I am spirit, and I am invulnerable, and I am eternal. Both things are things to keep in mind. Honor the earthly human experience. Do not deny it. Do not try to run away from it. And don't lie about it. I notice a lot of people when they're hurting, they don't want to say to anyone, especially in a spiritual arena, that I'm hurting. Because they think something's wrong with hurting. When hurting is a human, it's part of the human experience. I know people that never want to say they're confused when they're confused. And if they're behind the wheel of the car that's taking us to the restaurant we're supposed to go to, and they get lost, they're never going to say, I'm confused about where I'm going. <laughs> when it's OK to be confused about where you are or where you're going. And while you're confused and having that experience, know that it is encased in a large bubble where you are beyond who you are is all wisdom. Who you are is all knowing. Who you are is all understanding. It's kind of like I think about the little bubble part of me as being like my kid brother. I used to think he was me. And then I had this big brother that was the larger bubble. And my big brother is going to take care of me. But what I got was this I started thinking that I'm not the me. I mean, I'm temporarily going through the motions. I'm living a life called the life of Carlos Wayne Anderson. In the first chapter, October 16, 1951, 2.22 in the afternoon, he lands on the planet. He cries and is born. But the southern part knows he fell asleep in heaven awakened on earth and called it being born. So I think of the little guy, the guy that's in my human experience, as being my kid brother. And I am, I am the big bull. Mm -hmm. I am responsible for taking care of him and explaining to him the way things were explained to me when I was in the garden. I can remind, or I know that if I keep identifying as just the human self, I won't get out. But if I identify with the larger self, the spirit that I am, 
I can help out my human self, my, my human experiential self, I can help that little guy out enormously. And in fact, I'm the only one that can help that little guy out. You're the only one, you're the only Holy Spirit of the Creator who can rescue the little girl, little Martine. If you don't rescue her, she will try to get anybody that comes down the pike to rescue her. And they will fail miserably because they do not have the power. Your husband, your wife, your lover, your children, your parents, your good friends, they would rescue you in a heartbeat if they could. But they can't. No matter how much they love you, they can't give you what you need. They fail us again and again and again and again because we are expecting something of them that is impossible for them to give. Only I can give myself the self-esteem that I need. Only I can give myself a record of a history of getting up and moving on putting one foot in front of another foot, even through the valley of the shadow of death. You have done it. I can see it in your eyes. You have done it also. So have you. And so have you, brother. And so have you, my young, beautiful sister. Even at your age, you have always amassed a her story of getting up and moving on. One foot in front of another foot, in front of another foot, marching on even many times through the appearance of the valley of the shadow of I can't breathe, the shadow of death. I think about our young people who go off to school, and I think about the fact that school is just one among countless things that they are responsible for when they go to school. The whole social aspect of going to school, the whole idea of fitting in and not letting the parents down and living up to everyone's expectation and not wasting the money and hoping I'll find a friend and hoping my roommate is, is somebody I can get along with it hoping maybe somebody will like me and maybe I'll get a date. And they're thinking about so much. And a lot of it to us who are years away from it, we forget that some of that stuff is literally walking through the valley of the shadow of death. A lot of that stuff is, I can barely breathe kind of stuff. But I admire human beings. I admire the children of God. Because it's not just me. And it's not just you. It's everybody. Putting one foot in front of another. Marching on. And I don't care what you say about the condition of the world today. We have to acknowledge that in so many ways it is an improved field. And therefore what my mom and my dad had to walk through mm -hmm. was more of an experience of the valley of the shadow than I have ever been required to walk through. Just as my father's father and my mother's mother walked through stuff that they never had to walk through. But have you noticed people are walking through? People are still creating babies. Mm -hmm. People are still getting married. <laughs> People are still holding hope. People are still opening small businesses. People are still forgiving the one that hurt them. People are still letting themselves off the hook. And even though our numbers are down here, you guys are the proof.
people are still gathering together in the house of God on a Sunday morning when they don't have to go to work and could be doing anything else they pleased. Something awesome is going on. The tree leaves on the deciduous trees still have the nerve to spring into such colors in the fall that people come from all over the world just to see them. Tears stream down their faces when they look at the trees we're blessed to have in our own backyards. Something amazing is happening in this world. There are still people who are rescuing little children from situations like I and my sister were in. Mm -hmm. There is more information that is available. Mm -hmm. When I was being molested, I suddenly went from being a kid who was potty trained a long time ago when I was one years old. I suddenly started peeing in the bed and having night sweats. Nobody knew what that meant. Nowadays, if a kid starts peeing in the bed at seven, six, five years old, the parents know something is amiss. We have the information. I like to just think about it sometimes that my mom and dad and their mom and dad, they never got to grow up with Oprah <laughs> and all the information that she has brought to us the example that she has brought to us. I know so many people throughout the years that used to say things like, I want Oprah's money. That's the kind of money I want. I want some Oprah Winfrey money. <laughs> and then they get into a unity church and people say, it's not, it's not spiritually uh, correct uh, to say you want her money. Just uh, say that you want her prosperity consciousness. <laughs> so then those people started saying, they stopped saying, I want Oprah's money. And they started saying, I want Oprah's spiritual consciousness. I want Oprah's spiritual consciousness. A lot of these people thought that if they just affirmed it a hundred times a day for three or four months, they would suddenly just fall into some uh, mega millions. And I just saw people getting sad, like they got sad after they bought the, the little book and the tape, The Secret. The secret just says, keep your mind, just keep visualizing that pearl necklace. And it's going to come from the nothingness. Keep visualizing that bicycle. Keep visualizing that house. Just stand fast. It's like, oh, you got to do, yeah, the law of manifestation, the law of increase. And I looked at that and I said, there's a couple of other things you need to practice before practicing the law of increase. And one is the law of acceptance, and the other is the law of gratitude. Yeah. Accept what you do yes. have. Be grateful for everything yes. you have. Yes. And then that's the thank you. And then you can go to the more, please. But I didn't see a bunch of people going through the two part, the three-part <laughs> process. They jumped right to a visualizing a pearl necklace falling from the sky. <laughs> So I'll check in with you uh, next year. We'll see if that happens. See if, see if that, how that works out for you. So uh, anyway, it's, it's different steps that need to be taken. And so well, what was I saying right before that? Right before, oh, Oprah. Oprah. So I'm sitting in a room full of people at a church in Massachusetts. and. It was a huge thing of Oprah, we are all going to stand for a certain number of minutes, we are all just going to call in Oprah's prosperity. <laughs> Oprah, and they did that, and I realized that this church I was at, this was something that they had been doing and were going to continue doing for a month's period. And uh, I sat there going, I can pray for Oprah's kind of money, or I can go for Oprah's prosperity consciousness. One thing I don't want to leave out though, because it's one thing I know about Oprah. I might want to pray for Oprah's work ethic. 
she did not get what she's got by sitting somewhere affirming, <laughs> asking for the right consciousness or the right money. She found what she loved and her work ethic. In 20 years, she missed no days of work. Everybody gets colds. Everybody gets the flu. Everybody has headaches. Everybody's back goes out. Everybody stubs a toe. All this stuff was happening to Miss Oprah. Oh, Oprah. Everybody has a depressed time. Everybody goes through stuff with their significant other. You know her in Stedman. They do. They do. There were some thorns on them roses. They're like with everybody. But the girl did not miss a day of work for 20 years. Once I heard that, I went, give me Oprah's work ethic. And the universe will handle the rest. Give me that. That's the fifth principle. If I'm working toward the realization of my dreams, they're already accomplished in some way. I'm already there. When I told my kids when they were younger, we're going to Disneyland, we didn't have to pull into the gates for them to finally be at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. They were in Disneyland from the moment I told them, I'm taking you to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. At the end of the month, I'm taking you all to Disneyland. They got up from the table already in Disneyland, mm -hmm. in their minds. They were already there. They were already buying what they were going to buy and riding on the rides they were going to ride and taking pictures with Mickey and Minnie like they were going to do. They were already there. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity for us to already be there. As you're walking, know you're already there. Somebody said to Jonathan Livingston Siegel, what's the fastest way to fly from this point to that point across the bay? And Jonathan said, no, you're already there. <laughs> so even as you're living your little bubble experience, which is to be honored, know you're already there. You've already come. You've overcome every temptation to believe in your littleness. You've overcome every temptation to believe it is possible for you to be victimized. You've overcome every erroneous idea that there is something or someone that can ever separate you from the love of God. You have already overcome, and this is how you did it. We're already home with God, reflecting back on how we traveled from our place of not knowing into the fullness of knowing that we are one. <coughs> I'm really grateful that you, exactly the number of you, are the exact number of people and the exact people themselves for me to be with as I start the final week of wrapping up 65 revolutions of the earth around the sun. I'm so grateful for how you have blessed my heart. I'm so grateful to you, Dr. Carol, for the opportunity to participate in this ministry. Hold to faith, and don't you let it go. Oh, no, that wouldn't do. When you hold to faith in God, you come to know. At last, you come to know. God's word is true. Remember, God said, ask. It shall be given. Seek, you will find. Knock, the door will be opened to you. I've discovered in these almost 65 years that that is so very true. Sometimes the trick is knowing what I'm asking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't ask for more money anymore. I ask for more peace of mind. I don't ask for a bigger house. I ask for a bigger heart. I don't ask for more and more friends. I ask to be more and more friendly. When my mom was dying about five minutes before she took her last breath, 
I said, I make you a promise, Mama. I make you this promise. I am going to do far, 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 far less of what doesn't even matter. And I am going to do far, 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 far more of the few things that really do matter. You see, most stuff doesn't matter. But the few things that matter really, 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 really matter. And the last thing I'm going to do, Mama, I'm going to love like I have never loved before. Mama went home many years ago now, and I have kept my promise. I am in heaven. And each of you are in heaven with me. For those of you who know that this is true, I know it with you. And for those of you whose time for knowing has not yet come, I'll know it for you. This is my function. I'm alive for one reason and one reason only. to forward heaven on planet Earth, to extend peace and goodwill to everyone. This is the first time I'm ready to have a birthday that I can say that I died this year. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty awesome having died and then come back on your own. I thought they had brought me back with those electrical pads but they were off looking for one. They don't keep them in the room doing the process that I was having because only one in 100,000 people only has an issue, ever has an issue. So they were off going to find out something, getting the machine to bring me back. But apparently I got to the door and said, I'm not tired yet. I got more in more love to give, more encouragement to bring, more uplifting, more heaven to spread. And so I feel on this birthday, even though I'm getting ready to turn 65, I feel like I'm just going to be two months old. Because I flatlined on August 16th. And my birthday is October 16th. Wow. And I may look 65, <laughs> but I'm just a wee bitty baby. <laughs> I'm only two much. Oh, almost. <laughs> you know how little kids are. They gotta say, I'm three and four quarters. <laughs> four quarters would make you five. Oh, I meant three quarters. <laughs> so I'm one month and three weeks old. <laughs> I love you. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Uh -huh.